to see you here today. Today, uh, announcements may be a little brief. I don't have, I'm not using the bulletin that you are, so if you will, look at your announcements that are there. I may not repeat them because I don't have that version. If there, are there announcements in the bulletin? Are there? Good. Uh, one of the things I want to announce is that Keith Cranford is having a, a heart uh, procedure. When is it? Uh, you don't know? Tomorrow. Tomorrow? Tomorrow. We're glad you're here. Thank you. And we will be in prayer for Keith. Um, also, um, Isabel uh, and Emily need our prayers. Emily is, uh, was most upset that she couldn't be here and she was talking about taking vacation time for this time. I told her, absolutely not. Do not do that. Uh, that's a session decision, but I just I just express my personal beliefs that she should not. And thank you for your prayers for Evelyn and Ammon when Evelyn swallowed a penny yesterday and had to go to the hospital and get it extracted this morning. <clears throat> uh, I was told by Emily that uh, I believe that we're having one great hour sharing next week. And so this moment for mission will announce that. And please be prepared to bring a check or some cash to with you to uh, uh, pay toward the one great hour of sharing. Yes, 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 yes. Carry Watson. Pardon me? I want to pray for Sherry. Sherry Watson. Johnson. Watson. 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 I, didn't, I, I, didn't, I got in the Russian. I don't have my hair. So, <laughs> Watson. Watson. Sherry Watson. We will do that. And thank you, LC. And I'm sorry I'm so bad at hearing from up here. Okay, let's uh, begin our service with our call to worship. Jesus said, when I am lifted up, I will draw all people to myself. Blessed, Blessed be the God of our salvation, who bears our burdens and, and forgives our sins. And now, if we're able, let us stand for hymn 720, Jesus Calls Us. <coughs>
People of God, by the faith of Christ, your sins are forgiven. May you delight in the joy of your salvation. Thanks be to God. Now let's stand and say the glory. Sing the glory of God.
Testament reading is Matthew 5, 2 through 11. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. We all probably could have recited that. Heart. <clears throat> I changed the title of our sermon today, and I didn't change it until after I was done with it, and I think maybe that's the best way to give something a title, and it used to be, what does God ask after Micah 6 through 8? And on careful reading and studying of this passage, which we all know again probably by heart, I renamed it. And the title of our sermon today is, Here Are Your Orders. <laughs> and I guess maybe that came to me because Sarah and I re-watched A Few Good Men last night. <laughs> and watched uh, Orders that resulted in a man's death. These orders will result in a person's life, a life better lived. Incredibly, it wasn't until about 25 years ago that I discovered Micah 6, how I'd missed it all these years, having minored in religion at Center College and taught Sunday school in Louisville, Kentucky and taught Sunday school here. Uh, I don't know how I missed that for that long. And especially that is true because of the legal system uh, is based on justice. And when it jumped out, me, out, out at me from the pages of the Bible, it was like when you open one of those prank cards and something pops out at you, you know. And it did just that to me. Um, it's become one of my top three Bible verses that I love. Do justice, love mercy, walk humbly with your God. And through the years, I've seen it in different versions of the Bible, mercy is transplanted by the word kindness. And they're pretty much the same, but there's a little difference, as we know. When we think of mercy, we tend to think of granting somebody uh, a card out, a free card out of jail, I guess you'd say, when they didn't deserve it. And kindness goes a little farther than that. And we'll go through some various people's definition of kindness in a little bit. We do search for simplicity in life, don't we? Well, it's in Sunday school that I've taught for so many years. Uh, we see problems that seem to have no answers. And we can't understand why God lets bad things happen, for instance, to good people. And so often members of our class, rather than offering an explanation, would simply say, that's just one of those things I take on faith. Kind of like when Sarah says, that's one of those things I want to ask God when I confront you. <laughs> uh, so, um, oftentimes, I, I, I always have respect for that answer, but I almost always try to come back to that person and ask, you know, why? Why do you just trust it when you don't know what the hereafter, for instance, brings? <laughs> and I like to analyze things like this 
to challenge whether something is right or just, and if not, why not? And I just, from time to time, I never thought it was a correct answer just to say, well, that's just what I believe. I guess it's that liberal arts education that comes in and gives me problems so much with things in the Bible. And so we do think about these things and we do challenge ourselves and each other. But in theology, I have found even after a thorough analysis, we often come to the same old, tired, dead end and you just get back to faith, don't you? Because, dang it, you just can't explain it. The paradox we face as Christians are immense. Why is it that something may make no sense to our miraculous, God-given analytical brains, but yet we can still believe in it? We believe in what we believe so strongly that we base our hope for eternity on it. We don't just believe it for now, we believe it because of our childlike, trusting faith in God that we can live forever, that we can see our loved ones in heaven. The Christian faith is so curious to us and challenging to us that when we first read it, and oftentimes when we read it many, many times, we don't understand to turn the other cheek. We don't understand that the meek will inherit the earth. We don't understand that we must become like a child to enter the kingdom of heaven. We don't understand loving our enemies as ourselves. We don't understand that to save your life you must lose it. We don't understand that he who would become the greatest among you must be the servant of all. Challenges all. This religion we're committed to is confounding. It's counterintuitive. It tells us to be weak rather than strong. It tells us to unlearn everything the world has taught us. And I want to read you a quote from Theodore Roosevelt. I'm sorry. You don't want it. It didn't make it in. <laughs> oh, here it is. Human kindness has never weakened the stamina or softened the fiber of a free people. A nation does not have to be cruel to be tough. I love that. And he's right. Did you ever stop to consider that God asked us to overrule the brains he gave us? To overrule all the collective experiences of our lifetimes, all the things we're taught by our parents? To, to obtain an afterlife that we have neither seen nor heard, but which is based on the promises made in an ancient book put together by 40 scholars over the course of 1,500 years. But we do, don't we? A neutral observer might call us ignorant and foolish for believing these things, but we believe these things. To me, it's nothing short of miraculous that Christians exist at all. To me, our conviction, based on our unwavering belief in a higher power who calls us to be better than the rest of the world around us, makes us just, righteous, honorable creatures, not fools. Life on this planet is so complex, so ever-changing, so hard to make it through that we instinctively crave simplicity. And that's even more true than when in our lives we struggle to live like Christians. Simple is easy. You can remember simple. Everybody understands simple. But just like the devil being in the detail, the devil in this simple verse is, is in what justice means, what mercy means, and what humbly means, which we'll explore in a minute as in walking humbly with your God. Not that the devil has anything to do with this, but that was just to tune us into the vernacular. The difficult part is in what those words mean, what God's telling us. So who was Micah and why did he say these elementary things to his people? 
Michael was trying to break through to a people who were stubborn, who were following worldly passions to heathens and self-centered lives down a trail that he knew would lead to their collective destruction. Michael was one of the major, I'm sorry, one of the minor prophets. He preached at the end of what you might call the good times in Jewish history and just before his nation fell apart. He lived 737 to 696 B.C. in Judah and is the author of the book of Micah. Micah's messages were directed mainly towards Jerusalem and were a mixture of denunciations and prophecies. He predicted the destruction of both Samaria and Jerusalem for their sins. The people of Samaria were rebuked for worshiping idols that were brought with the income earned by prostitutes. That's how low they had gotten. Micah surrounded a lot, uh, sounded a lot like Moses after Moses discovered that the people had made graven idols after he had left to get the Ten Commandments. Moses in uh, Deuteronomy 10 told them what God wanted, strikingly similar to what Micah says here. Listen. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways and love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep his statutes, which I command you today, for your good. Indeed, heaven and the highest heavens belong to the Lord your God, also the earth that is in it. Micah says it more simply. For what does the Lord require of you? Do justice, love mercy, kindness, and walk humbly with your God. Notice that this is a message that God doesn't ask. And I've seen it in biblical uh, terms before. And it says, what does your Lord ask of you? And he doesn't do that. He commands us. It's a requirement. What are these requirements? What are requirements? Requirements, we know what requirements are. They're absolute necessities. You have to do them. There's no two ways about it. In doing them, they become a part of your everyday life, God knows. It's like you, we say that you can start a habit if you do the same thing for three weeks. Um, I, my memory's not good enough to last three weeks most of the time, but they say people, some intelligence can do that. There are plenty of requirements for things we do in life. We have to have a driver's license to drive. If you borrow money, you have to pay it back. If you fly an airplane or a plane, you have to have a ticket from the FAA, don't you? If you earn an income, you got to pay taxes. Life is full of requirements. We know that and we get used to it. We don't have arguments with it. We don't fuss. We just do it. The requirements Micah tells us that God has put forth sound so simple and so clean. They're easy to learn. They're simple to put in our pockets and carry around with us. Our God is consistent. What he required of the Israelites 2,700 years ago are still the same things that he requires of us today. We know all about the Good Samaritan. This was a man who in that day would have been the least likely person to help a Jew. This Jewish traveler had been beaten, robbed, stripped of his clothing, and left for dead. Three people passed him by. A Jewish priest, a, a Jewish rabbi, and a third religious muckety-muck. We probably, it's probably a Pharisee or Sadducee, we don't know for sure. But it was only the Samaritan, one thought by the Jews to be unclean, a heathen, unworthy, who stopped to hell, who gave the victim his own clothing, who carried him to shelter, do justice, love mercy, walk humbly with your God. Let me tell you about a Harvard professor who I think was a very wise man, who taught at the Harvard School of Divinity. He gave one of the best tests I've ever heard of in my life. He was giving this final exam to theological students and he was studying Kant's moral imperative. Immanuel Kant, you know, a Prussian moral philosopher in the late 1700s. 
The exam was two hours long. One 10 minute break out in the hall. It's the only place they could go. The students wrote furiously up on the question for an hour. And then the break came and everyone went to the break in the hall. Uh, there wasn't any discussion about the test, of course, that would be cheating. But small talk was everywhere. People were, you know, getting coke, getting drink of water, smoking a cigarette, whatever, going to the bathroom. And when they did all of that, they returned from the second phase and they began scribbling once again. Weeks later, when they got their exam results, the professor failed them all. He wrote the same narrative on each exam. I was out in the hallway at the break during your final exam. No one, not one of you, stopped to offer a kind word or assistance to the poor street person humped up over in the corner. Nobody did. You thought your test was what you were writing on your papers. It wasn't. In Micah's day, if you were down and out, humped up in the corner, if you will, you needn't look for anyone to help you from anyone in a position that could help. The poor were being abused by the rich and influential. It was a have and a have not society in which both the civil and religious leaders who were charged with taking care of the most vulnerable in that city were taking advantage of the poor for their own benefit. Judges were bought by bribes. Merchants were using deceptive weights in selling their wares. The corrupt rulers, false prophets, and ungodly priests all became targets for Micah's warnings. And he exposed, on the one hand, the injustice of the people, holding it up against the righteousness of God. I want to read you another quote that I love. If I put it in my paper. <laughs> imitation of strength. Isn't that good? Rudeness is a weak person's imitation of strength. Micah, who prophesied, prophesied from Judah, was the hero of the little man, the man who had no power or influence, who was at the bottom row of society. I think of Alan Jackson's song about the little man, about the big companies coming in and shutting him down. We have that in our own day, don't we? Um, if he had been taking that exam at Harvard, Micah would have been late to phase two. Abraham Lincoln said, I have always found that mercy bears richer fruits than strict justice. There was a dark side, though, to Micah's earlier prophecy to his people. He was trying to get to them and suck them in the stomach and wake them up. Listen to this. So this is from Micah 4 also. And as you rulers of the house of Israel, is it not for you to know justice? You who hate good and love evil, who strip the skin from my people and the flesh from their bones, who also eat the flesh of my people, flay their skin from them, break their bones and chop them in pieces like meat for the pot, like flesh in the cauldron. Then they will cry to the Lord, but he will not hear them. He will even hide his face from them at that time because they have been evil in their deeds. He wouldn't miss any words, would he? The challenge and struggle for us in these days of giveaways, of panhandlers, of scammers, is to make our way through who the needy are and who the scammers are. How can we offer kindness and mercy without being bugged or duped sometimes in the face of all these imposters? As the king of Siam always says about the Western ideas and culture in the king and I, Tis a puzzlement. I'm sure Michael would agree. 
that the problems and the frustrations we face about charity in our world today are great, but they don't give us a free pass from doing justice and loving kindness if we mean to walk with the Lord. Although now we have to be smarter than ever in our giving, we must err on the side of loving, helping the neighbor in need by giving through our church and through charities that are reputable, by one-on-one -on -one kindnesses that we know need our help. In our land of plenty, we're called on to err, if we must, on the side of kindness rather than wholesale skepticism and rejection. We are to care and be kind rather than being scoffers and skeptics. Yes, we have to be smarter and more cautious today, but I don't think God wants us to give up justice and mercy and kindness. Once burned, if we say, all right, that's it, I'm never going to help anyone again. Then and there, we've taken the fork in the road that takes us farther apart from God rather than walking with God. Even though the other fork is a harder way and sometimes more risky, that's the one we're to take. Do justly. Doing justice in my line of work too often means giving someone what they deserve in terms of payback. I remember many, many, many years ago, Preston used to do a good bit of criminal work and on more than one occasion. I'd ask him, what's your defense, Preston? when it was obvious that the guy had done it. He said, well, that's easy. He had it coming. <laughs> <laughs> In our normal understanding of justice, when you do something wrong, there's a penalty. You get punished. Our system reads out money in civil cases. In the criminal system, it's fine or jail time or even the death sentence. In a social sense, doing justice is treating others fairly, even in every aspect of our lives. It also means working with groups or associations to offer assistance to those who can't make it without extra help. But we lean on government too much these days, and that's part of the problem, in my opinion. Love mercy. We all know what mercy is. It's compassion, it's sympathy, it's gentleness. Benevolence, helpfulness. We are grateful to someone who writes a note to us when we're going through a hard time. And don't forget that kindness isn't just for those outside our church and our family. Taking family members for granted is not exercising the kindness that God expects. I sometimes feel in my own family that I treat my children differently than I would a client or a friend. We have to guard against that kind of thing. And let's not forget about some things that aren't kind. Unleashing our tongues. The tongue has no bones, but it's strong enough to break a heart. Be careful what you say, says Joel Osteen. You can say something hurtful in 10 seconds, but 10 years later, the words are still there. Isn't that true? And then Mother Teresa had this to say. Kind words can be short and easy to speak, but their echoes are truly endless. Love that. Walk humbly with your God. Our God is a giving God who wants the best for us and for his creation. When we walk humbly with him, we think more of others than we do of ourselves. We make this a better place. We offer the loving kindness to others in need like Christ would do if he were here. Let's focus for a minute on the word walk. Walk implies slow. It implies measured. Walking is the opposite of running, which is what we all do throughout our busy lives. But walking is most often a slow, deliberate step. Slow it down and let God catch up with you is the message. Be with Him. He wants to be beside us. Focus on the word humbly. 
humbly, not full of yourself, not preoccupied with yourself. Jesus said the greatest person in the kingdom of heaven is the person who is humble like a little child. In the New Testament, the followers of Jesus were called by called uh, Christian only ones, but they were repeatedly called servants. Humble servants were the opposite end of the spectrum from the emperors, governors, and religious rulers of that day. Humility is sacrificing oneself enough to listen to the needs of others. Humility is a part of the art of listening to another. Where you forget yourself for a moment and actually hear what the other person is telling you. Mark Twain said this, Kindness is the language which the deaf can hear and the blind can see. Ralph Waldo Emerson said, You cannot do a kindness too soon, for you never know how soon it will be too late. Humility is also the art of listening to God. Some call it receptive meditation, whereby you forget the busyness of your own mind for a while and actually listen to what God is saying to you. To walk humbly with God is to sacrifice this self that is so self-centered and focus on someone other than you and your needs. And then the verse says, your God. Curious. Your God would belong to you, wouldn't he? It's not a possession. What that means is your God is that your God will walk with you. He is personal to you. He listens to you. He helps you. He made you. He accepts you as you are. Your God stands with you in the valley of the shadow of death. Your God forgives you. Your God walks with you as you travel the circle of life. I love Micah 6, 8. Do justice, love kindness, walk humbly with your God. You know those words now, they're yours. Carry them with you. For me, in preparing this sermon and delivering it here has given me some time to slow down and walk a little with God. To question myself and my busyness, to question what, what is important to me. And that's my wish for you today, that in justice and mercy, you will walk the rest of your days humbly and with your God. Amen. Let's now, if we have a prayer here, do we not? Apostles' Creed. I'm sorry? Apostles' Creed. Prayer for illumination. Apostles', Apostles Creed. Apostles' Creed. Oh, the Apostles' Creed. Yes, we do. That's out of, thank you. <laughs> That's out of order on that. Let's stand as we say together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty. Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered the Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From, from thence he shall come to judge the quick, the quick and the dead. dead. I, believe I believe in the Holy Ghost, Ghost the Holy Catholic Church, Church the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Would you bow while we speak to our God? Dear Lord and Father, create in us a clean heart and renew a right spirit within us.
During the final days of his earthly life, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears. And in faithful obedience, he opened the way to eternal salvation. Let us open our hearts this day as we lift up our deepest needs and concerns to the one who is mighty to walk with us. We pray for all leaders and people that by the power of your cross, you would drive out all violence, domination, and injustice in our world as you draw us to your Christ. We pray for our war-ravaged world that you would teach us to walk together in your way of righteousness and peace. We pray for the vocation of the church, that our prayers would bear the fruit of action as we hear the cries of pain and suffering of those in need. We pray for Keith Cranford. We pray for Evelyn. We pray for Isabel. We pray for Emily. And ask that you bring them all health and keep them safe. <clears throat> We pray for the poor, the terrified, the oppressed, and those who are too much alone. That they may find a home in you as we serve them in your name. We pray also, Lord, for Sherry Watson and that you bring her back to health. As your son anticipated his death on the cross in light of your steadfast love, may all who have died or who are dying be at rest in your eternal care. Through Christ, with Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, we glorify you, Almighty God, with unending thanks and praise. And now we pray collectively that perfect prayer your Son taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Uh, it is this time for our offertory, and as we're doing, uh, we will not take it up, but we will be offering our uh, blessings in the vestibule, and uh, let's now bless our blessings. Unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and takes on new life, it remains just a single grain. With grateful hearts, let us bring the fruit of our lives to God. May we stand and say the doxology. <clears throat>
A God whose hand was written, the hand of the law of love upon your heart, guide you on your lifelong journey to Him, starting with one person, one prayer, and one small selfless deed at a time. And walk with Him who loves, forgives, and calls us home will surely bring you a life fulfilled in ways you've never known before. Amen.